Down center on your anxieties, Obi-Wan. Keep your concentration here and now where it belongs. But Master Yoda said I should be mindful of the future. But not at the expense of the moment. An older Jedi Knight cautions a younger one as Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor discuss the mystery of the Force in Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. And on this special program, I'll review the new Star Wars movie and also talk with George Lucas about the saga that he began 22 years ago. And we'll look at excerpts from a 1983 program in which Gene Siskel and I analyze the first Star Wars trilogy. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. I'd like to begin by reviewing The Phantom Menace, a film that involves the early days of characters who are already familiar to us from the first three Star Wars movies. Characters like Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, Yoda, and even prototypes of our old friends R2-D2 and C-3PO. As the film opens, an intergalactic trade war is in progress. How do you think this trade viceroy will deal with the Chancellor's demands? These Federation types are cowards. The negotiations will be short. Qui-Gon and young Obi-Wan Kenobi quickly find a sidekick in the movie's most interesting new character, an alien named Jar Jar Binks. This character, whose movements are based on a performance by the actor Ahmad Best, is completely computer-generated, showing how smoothly reality can interact with special effects in the film. If they find us, they will crush us, grind us into tiny pieces, and blast us into oblivion. Ah. Your support is well seen. This way, hurry! Here is the film's crucial encounter. Qui-Gon meets young Anakin Skywalker on the planet Tatooine, which of course was Luke Skywalker's home in the first the film. The Jedi Knight instantly senses that the young boy, played by Jake Lloyd, is suffused by the Force. Here he must part with his mother to be about his father's business, even though the identity of his father is a deep mystery. If I ever see you again, what does your heart tell you? I hope so. Yes. I guess. Then we will see each other again. It wouldn't be Star Wars without a lightsaber duel as the good guys take on the enigmatic Darth Maul. And here's our good friend Yoda, who's barely past middle age in this scene in a meeting of the Jedi Council that also involves Mace Windu, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Yoda is a Muppet-like creation, controlled and played by Frank Oz. Trained as a Jedi, you request for him, hmm? Finding him was the will of the Force. I have no doubt of that. Bring him before us, then. Natalie Portman stars as Queen Amidala, who deals firmly with a senator from her home planet. This character, played by Ian McDermott, you may remember from the earlier three Star Wars movies. I've decided to go back to Naboo. Go back? But your majesty, be realistic, that they'll force you to sign the treaty. I will sign no treaty, Senator. My fate will be no different than that of our people. And those wonderful skyscapes give you a taste of the remarkable visuals in The Phantom Menace, which for me are the best elements in this fourth Star Wars film. George Lucas told me in 1990 that after the third film, he put the series on hold until computers could catch up with the ideas in his imagination. And now it looks like they have. He's too old. Anakin will become a Jedi, I promise you. Do not defy the Council Master, not again. I shall do what I must, to be one. If you would just follow the code, you would be on the council. They will not go along with you this time. You still have much to learn, my young apprentice. There are truly astonishing shots in this film, realizing a host of otherworldly creatures. And the film features alien cities and vistas, and my eyes drank them in. There's also a lot of excitement, for example, in a race where young Anakin Skywalker proves he's an instinctive pilot. And there's a vast Senate chamber where the debaters float on platforms in the middle that really arouse my sense of wonder. But maybe there could be a little more human, or maybe we should say character interest in the film. This movie has a lot of setting up to do. It begins the whole saga. It lays the groundwork for relationships, which we sense are going to pay off in the next two movies, 
And so the story level isn't always as interesting as the visuals. Characters are dealing with things that are going to happen later in the series rather than dealing in the here and now sometimes. Still, this movie is a remarkable achievement, a marriage of imagination and special effects, and my thumb is up with a lot of admiration. The day after I saw The Phantom Menace, I sat down for a talk with George Lucas, and predictably, he wanted to talk mostly about special effects. We'll get to that conversation in a moment, but first let's flash back nine years to that 1990 conversation I had with Lucas at his Skywalker Ranch, where we looked ahead to what he wanted to accomplish in this movie. That computer technology isn't really to a point now where it's cost effective. And I would say within five years, uh, the computer technology will be cheaper. And the old fashioned This is way. amusing because people are so uh, willing to casually say, oh, it's all done on computers. Whatever you're yeah. talking about, people say, oh, it's all done on computers these days. And it isn't all done on computers yet. Yeah. I've, believe me, I've been involved in a lot of state-of-the-art computer technology, and then you'd be surprised what they can't do. <laughs> well, that was in 1990, but computers have been moving fast, and they can sure do it right now. Lucas told me after the Phantom Menace screening that he knew computers would get faster, but he didn't realize how much faster and more versatile they would become. So, you know, through struggling with ILM over the years and developing this uh, sort of new digital revolution uh, and, you know, kind of hoping that the technolo technology sort of advanced itself, we finally got on Jurassic Park to the point where I could say, we can create a photorealistic digital character that looks as real as any actor does. And with that, I started saying we can do the new Star Wars and I can do it and writing it was so much fun because I just said I am not going to limit myself on this one I'm gonna open the box I'm just gonna write whatever I want and no matter how outrageous and I'm just gonna see if I can pull it off Lucas told me he still has a lot of affection for Yoda but that such physical puppets however evolved and skillfully manipulated have their limits compared to animation before I think uh, with Frank Oz and Yoda I was able to carry sort of you know, puppet acting or, you know, rubber creature acting as far as it could go. I think Frank's performance was amazing. And, uh, you know, for a strange creature who has to act and do a performance, uh, he really pulled that off. But he couldn't walk very far. He, you know, there's a very, very limited kind of performance that I could do with something like that. And I was just so desperate to have uh, an alien creature that I could turn into a real character that had a real personality that could act and do a good performance, you know, equal to the other, the other actors in the film. Jar Jar Binks, on the other hand, can fully interact with the human characters in three dimensions. He fits right in. He looks very realistic, and uh, or as realistic as Yoda does anyway. And uh, you know, it's and his performance is really good. Despite you know. the advances in computerized performers, however, Lucas thinks it's going to be a long, long time, and maybe never before actors can be replaced by chips. It's not just a person standing there saying lines, you know, they bring a lot of, uh, a lot of the character and a lot of the, the creativity comes through the actors and their, their contribution. But until you can get these Jack Nicholson type computers, which I think is going to be <laughs> not in our lifetime, <laughs> I think that actors are safe. You should have seen the glint in George Lucas's eyes when he observed how quickly computers are evolving. Next year's $200 PlayStation for Kids, he said, will be faster than the mainframes of a few years ago. And the result will be a new era of movie epics as directors create scenes that would simply be too expensive to film by conventional methods. When we come back, Lucas talks about how Star Wars has its roots in myth and legend. Your destiny lies along a different path from mine. The Force will be with you. Always. Yes, Greedo. As a matter of fact, I was just going to see your boss. Tell Jabba that I've got his money. So the underlying trust of Star Wars really is the values of the Western in the 23rd century. Yeah, it was really the Western that started it. Yes, I bet you have. But Westerns weren't the only influence on Star Wars. George Lucas studied anthropology in college and, of course, drew inspiration from Joseph Campbell's books about mythology and creating the mythological underpinnings of the Star Wars movies. There's a lot of Zen Buddhism in the Force, and there's a heavy element of the Judeo-Christian tradition in the movies, as I suggested to actor Liam Neeson, whose character prepares the way for the young Anakin Skywalker. You're basically playing John the Baptist. Thanks, Roger. Aren't you? 
Um, you know, I'd, I'd never thought of it that before, but uh, there's a there's a similarity to that uh, that story, right enough. You prepare the way. Prepare the way and find the chosen one. You know. Yes. And of course, the chosen one doesn't have a ordinary sort of father. Yeah, that's true. When we learned that young Anakin may have a special mission and that he contains an unusual concentration of the Force, of course, we're reminded of Christ-like figures, and the movie reinforces those identifications. You refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the Force. You believe it's this boy? I don't presume to. But you do. Revealed, your opinion is. I request the boy be tested, Master. Well, of course, we've seen the other movies, and so we already know that Anakin's son, Luke, is really the chosen one, and that what Qui-Gon senses is not Anakin's fate, but the fate of his son, of the next generation. What does all of this mean, all of this mythology? Well, I think it means that while Star Wars is not going to put organized religion out of business, in building on myth and belief, it probably reaches more deeply into the imaginations of its viewers and touches their values more firmly than mere adventure pictures possibly could. Coming up next, the vast influence of Star Wars on other movies. The cave is collapsing. This is no cave. What? Well, that's the first double-edged lightsaber in a Star Wars movie, but in a way, a lightsaber is a lightsaber, and here's something that's probably inevitable. There was no way The Phantom Menace could possibly look as original to most people as Star Wars did in 1977. The first time that zzz, we saw that lightsaber, we'd never seen anything quite like that before. The visual vocabulary of Star Wars has now, however, been recycled, borrowed, and ripped off by so many other movies that its visual universe, which was completely original when Lucas unfolded it, has become a little familiar. And for that matter, not everything started with Star Wars. I remember, for example, how stunning it was when I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey and a spaceship appeared from behind the edge of the screen and slowly revealed how large it was. The opening of the first Star Wars movie used the same kind of shot to even greater effect. By now, of course, 22 years later, that kind of introduction of a spaceship has become standard in the movies, and we've seen it in other films. For example, Alien. Starship Troopers. We break net now and take you live to Klandafu, where the invasion has begun. Wing Commander. And, of course, the Star Trek movies. Captain's Log, Stardate 486-32.4. Here's another influential Star Wars design detail. Before Star Wars, space was stark and spare and clean, and so were the vessels that went there. Look at the antiseptic appearance of the inside of the space station in 2001. But with Star Wars, space and other planets began to look dusty and rusty and lived in. Luke Skywalker's speeder looks like a modernistic jalopy. I can't abide those Jawas. Disgusting creatures. And future grunge and decay were reflected in Blade Runner. A new life awaits you in the off-world colony. Strange day. So, Dan, you looking forward to the new year? Not really. I mean, what's the point? And Alien 3. And Star Wars also upped the ante for the design of aliens. In classical science fiction, aliens often look like humanoid bipeds, for example, in The Day the Earth Stood Still. But after George Lucas gave us creatures like Yoda, Size matters not. Look at me. And Jabba the Hutt, You will bring Captain Solo and the Wookiee to me. <laughs> Aliens got a new look, as in Starship Troopers. And Enemy Mine. It's pretty obvious that 2001 and 1968 and Star Wars in 1977 provided the great divide in science fiction films. Before them, science fiction looked a little bit like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, and you automatically walked into the theater ready to laugh, at the special effects, except for a few exceptions 
like Forbidden Planet. But after these two influential movies, nothing ever looked the same again, and science fiction emerged as an important major film genre. When we come back, a trip back to a Star Wars show that Gene Siskel and I did in 1983. In 1983, when Return of the Jedi was released, Gene Siskel and I did a special show called The Secret of Star Wars. Well, Gene wasn't able to see The Phantom Menace, although I'm going to make good on a promise to him to take his young son to see it. But what we had to say at the end of the first trilogy is, I think, still interesting today. Now, as for why the whole series as a whole has been popular, I think quality control is the big answer. Mm -hmm. Once the first Star Wars film was a hit, the rest of the series was going to depend on how well the second Star Wars film was made. Then Star Wars would become not just the name of a movie, but a brand name. lesson here, if you want a hugely successful series, then make sure that that second one is a winner. I'll give you a couple of other examples. Mm -hmm. Two very successful movies, Rocky and Grease. Yes. Rocky 2, the same cast, the right. same creativity, the same energy. Romantic. A big hit, and Rocky 3 was a bigger and hit. And it'll go on. I saw part of the message. You... I seem to have found it. General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. Now, one of the most tried and true archetypes of mythology is the young hero trying to become a man through a quest, through a journey. This appeals to all of us in the audience, even to adults who don't exactly feel like mature men and women quite yet, and so we want to experience this quest for ourselves. Master, moving stones around is one thing. This is totally different. No, no different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Now, two other elements from mythology are the powerful father figure and the heroine in distress. And in Star Wars, the dominant father figure is Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Alec Guinness. Boys need fathers, young princes need wise men, and Obi-Wan Kenobi fills both roles. And the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. First of all, you've got the mythological underpinnings of the story. Right -o. This is a universal story that everyone can identify with. Right. Then we have the quality control, the great technology, the great special effects. There's something else here, and that's a goofy, almost childlike sense of fun. Mm -hmm. The kind of fun of that you got out of Saturday serials uh, 20, 30 years ago. All right, I'll and what it seems to me is that frequently in the movies, whenever they made a movie that had that sense of fun, they felt they didn't have to be serious about anything else. They could have oh, lousy special effects. They could come up with any story at all. But to have absolutely top flight credits yes. connected every, with that fun is yeah. the, is the uh, we're key. Watching, we're watching corporate Hollywood work here uh -huh. at the top of its form, mm -hmm. or at least Northern California. <laughs> and that was 1983. Of course, in the years since then, George Lucas has been pushing the envelope year after year with his special effects company, Industrial Light and Magic. He mentioned the dinosaurs that he made for Spielberg's Jurassic Park, and there's hardly been a major science fiction film in all this time that ILM hasn't had its hand in some way. When we come back, George Lucas reveals his own secret of Star Wars. More than a week before Phantom Menace was set to open, these kids were already camped out to buy tickets. I talked to a couple of them, and one told me his dad stood in line to buy him a ticket 22 years ago, and now he was going to return the favor and buy a ticket for his dad. The young woman told me she was taken to see Star Wars when she was three weeks old. The Force is in me, she said. It may sound corny, but I believe the Star Wars series has a certain sweetness and old-fashioned nobility that satisfies a hunger in these times of mindless action movies and rampant irony and cynical comedies. And I think George Lucas feels the same way. You know, we live in very cynical times. You know, they're, they're very mean-spirited, they're very cynical. It's very hip to, be, to make fun of people and put them down and, and kind of... Everything is super hip, you know, in terms of everybody's put down for everything and, and this is the big criticism of Star Wars in the beginning was it's you know it's naive it's sort of hope filled it's uh, very young it's it's uh, you know it's it's everything anti hip you know it's kind of wide eyed and optimistic and what a one you know it's very Pollyannish in its optimism People just need that 
little bonbon in their life, that little thing that says, you know, it's not a terrible world. No, but, you know, you aren't that bad. Everything's kind of okay. You know, you can, you know, yeah, there are bad people in the world, and you have bad inside you, but you can overcome that. Uh, and I think, you know, as silly as it is, it's, that's something that's necessary in a society. And may the force be with you. That's it for this special show. Remember, you can hear our reviews each week at siskel-ebert.com. And next week, more new movies, including Notting Hill, with Julia Roberts as a movie star falling in love with London bookseller Hugh Grant. Probably best not to tell anyone about this. I'll tell myself sometimes, but don't worry, I wouldn't believe it. And Tea with Mussolini, with Judy Dench, Joan Plowright, and Cher. Until then, the balcony is closed.